Okay, if you haven't been able to figure it out yet, I have got the chapter in our book on website advertising. <laughs> the sign approach. I'm telling you what, that gets seared in the mind of a Mormon. You bet it does. <laughs> and that's why I use it. Hey, uh, let me say a quick prayer. Lord, thank you for this time that we have. I pray that you might use me to effectively communicate what you've laid on my heart. Thank you for this time. Thank you for Carl and for all the headaches that he's gone through to be able to share with others the good news. So we pray for his family that you might bring them out of the darkness of Mormonism into your marvelous light. And we'll thank you for this. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, I'd like to start out with a verse here. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine forth before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Yeah, okay, I may be taking that a little out of context here with the sign, but the general point is worthwhile, is that in your evangelism, whatever God has called you to do, get it out there and trust God with the results. So in the short time I have, I want to convince you, my brothers and sisters in the Lord, that you need to be at least supportive of me and other fellow believers who like to use signs to draw people to Jesus under certain circumstances. I'm trying to get you to loosen up a little bit here and be open to the modest claim that using signs at some LDS events is actually a good, worthwhile thing to do. Okay? More generally than that, I'm trying to recruit more radicals for the cause of Christ. People who are always looking for more creative ways to get the kingdom of God out to people. As many as people, despite all the controversy that ensues from it. Now let's talk about some pros and cons for using a sign. Let's talk about why would one want to use the sign to begin with. Well, the obvious reason is simple advertising. <laughs> People get the word out more, right? And then sometimes it's the only way to reach a mass audience. I remember last year when I was in Tucson for the temple opening that was going on there. This, they were busing people in about uh, three miles away into the temple grounds themselves. Obviously, I'm not going to be able to walk into temple grounds with my signs. I have to stay outside. Foot traffic was non-existent. It was over 100 degrees outside. Okay, so you had these buses coming by every five minutes or so, and sometimes. And uh, cars, a lot of traffic out there, no foot traffic. But So what can you do? How do you reach a mass audience like that? The only way you can do that is to get a sign out there to advertise so that they can check it out sometime. All right, now let's look at some cons for using a sign to reach LDS. Sometimes a situation doesn't call for it and it may adversely affect the situation. I mean, it can be overkill if a situation primarily calls for one-on-one -on -one dialogue or any dialogue whatsoever, for relational evangelism, lifestyle evangelism, as Carl put it. Look, I don't use a sign at my LDS family gatherings. Right? You understand that? Uh, it would be crazy. Now, the leadership here at Ephraim Church of the Bible has determined that for everyone's benefit, they feel that the situation on the street prior to the pageant calls for the avoidance of signs. And I've submitted to that decision. However, most evangelicals are off the clock when pageant starts. Okay. 
And so I've been encouraged by the church here to use my lighted sign when everybody leaves the pageant and they're not really up for talking to anybody. They just want to get home as quickly as they can. Here's another case in point for you, and this is probably going to shock some of you. I took off my josephlight.com sign from the back of my minivan at one point when I was going to meet a Mormon at my home. This lady, now why would I do that? I mean, I'm Rob. I get the gospel out all over the place, right? Well, I did that because my daughter had just started going over to play with their daughter, their classmates, okay? And I was coming back home, and I was going, ah, she was going to meet me at home. She's going to see the sticker. I don't want to ruin that opportunity, that relational opportunity I have there to be able to establish trust with this family that I can later get the gospel of these people. And I want my daughter to continue to go over there and play with them. So if you think that the leadership and I are simply being feckless, weak, and we should be bold in every situation, including these that I brought up, then can I just tell you, I think you're being myopic. And you have no sensitivity for being open to the various strategies that God uses to reach others for the cause of Christ. All right, let's look at the second thing that might be said. Well, signs convey a protest, and it turns people off. Well, what does turn people off? What does that mean? I mean, my message? Well, I don't, to be honest, I don't see that. I mean, these people are either turned off already, or they're somewhat open to it. And typically, they aren't going to use some guy on the street with a sign as an excuse to stay away from the one <laughs> who is calling them to himself. I'm simply a trigger for their already hostile reaction to Christ. It seems more likely to me that these individuals are turned off from getting into a one-on-one -on -one conversation with me. And that seems to be true in most cases. I, I readily admit that. But why... I want to ask the question here, why should one-on-one -on -one dialogues or dialogues in general always be the mod modus operandi for reaching people for the cause of Christ? Why should they, or these dialogues, always have a, the monopoly on ev evangelistic conversations? Well, typically the response is, is if you don't monopolize dialogues in your evangelism, then you'll turn more people off than can be won. But why worry about that if we are told by our Lord that the majority are going to hell anyway? Broad is the road that leads to destruction, Jesus said. I mean, that shouldn't surprise us that most people are going to end up in hell. So why not think of in, in the terms of some is better than none? in this particular situation. I mean, we could think of certain military rescue operations that work this way, in which the plan is always to get the most as you can, but you realize, pragmatically speaking, most aren't going to make it. Okay? Now, it's certainly true that many a times my josephly.com sign does turn people off to talking to me. However, People who see it still remember it, and quite a number will look at it at some point when they're ready to and get another point of view. You understand that the Mormons are very prideful people. I mean, I could talk in stereotypes here, right? Stereotypes can be true or they could be false. I'm giving you a true stereotype. Mormons are prideful. I mean, we're dealing with people who think they're gods in embryo, right? Okay, so with people of that sort, these people are looking over their shoulders to see who's going to be thinking that I might be wavering in my faith at all just by talking to this anti, right? And so a lot of them just won't even bother talking to me because of that. But I'll tell you, some point, a lot of times, even later that day, they'll go home, they'll whip out 
their phone, they'll check out the site. And Google Analytics confirms that. So for all these people that say, I'm just wasting my time out there, they don't know what they're talking about. The facts are very clear from Google Analytics. The next day, I look it up, and I see when I go out, I always get a bump from, from what I do out there. Now, some, it may not be that day, later that day. It may be, as we'll see in the testimonies I'm going to read here in a minute, it may be years down the road. But this isn't easily forgotten. It, it's burning on your retinas right now. You see? You're not going to forget this. Most of you are probably going to look up the website at one point. That's what I'm banking on. All right, let's look at uh, another con here. If most people don't want to see the sign, then those signs are disrespectful. And as Christians, we should not be disrespectful. Well, doesn't that depend on the nature of the sign? And why should we simply follow what the majority determines? In other words, isn't truth a consideration? I mean, 10 years ago, Great Britain started putting out these graphic signs on their cigarette cartons. And last time I was there in Great Britain, I was thinking, man, I'm not seeing as many people smoke as much as they used to over there. But you should, I mean, have you guys seen these signs that they have on the, I mean, it is horrendous. And it probably does a good job. It's scaring a lot of people from smoking. Well, obviously there can be respect even when there's offense. That should be clear. All right, let's look at another one. Jesus never protested or used a sign at some event. Well, I mean, what was going on when Jesus cleansed the temple, right, on occasion? If that wasn't a protest event, I don't know what is, right? Uh, in addition, God gives signs. He gives signs all the time. He gives signs through the things that are made so that mankind is without excuse, as Psalms 19 and Romans 1 says. Jesus himself gave signs over and over again, miracles which clearly spoke of who he was. And since he was God, who willingly gave his life, he allowed a sign to be put over his head when he was crucified. And that sign gave reference to who he was. Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. Well, but Jesus never used a sign like you're using on a, with a website and go and make people upset. Well, I mean, <laughs> sure he didn't do that, but uh, I mean... He, he didn't, he didn't use microphones, right? He didn't use videos. He didn't use all sorts of modern communications. Nonetheless, the point remains is that he caused a lot of controversy. And that's our next point. It's just too controversial, and we're supposed to be peacemakers after all. One pastor who I wrote, I tried to get his support in, for a, a temple opening at one time. And I wanted to come, I wanted to stay with somebody in an area that had a temple opening going on. I wanted to be able to speak at his church. The guy wrote me back and declined my invitation. He said, while I agree with your convictions and admire your passion, I do not agree with your methods Evangelical leaders and churches have worked hard the last several years to build loving, respect-based relationships with our LDS friends and neighbors, and we are beginning to see some fruit born of that. Your confrontational methods would undo lots of that work and potentially create an adversarial relationship that puts them on the defensive and destroys the trust that we're trying to build. Now, in response, I don't see what I have to do with their trust of other Christians. I mean, if LDS don't trust me, that's fine. But, I mean, trust 
can still be maintained with these other Christians in that area and the cultivation of loving relationships they foster. All they have to do is just tell the people, even though I don't agree with it, but they say, I don't agree with the methods that, they, that this guy Rob uses. Then again, what I do out on the street may be, just think about this, just may be the occasion for uh, that long overdue conversation between Christians and Mormons. Hmm? I mean, I see this over and over again when I'm out on the street preaching at about 9 o'clock at night, and I get this crowd around me. And Christians, you guys, come around, these LDS people, and they simply, I mean, I make it easy for you guys to get into conversations. All you have to do is go, hey, what do you think about what this guy's saying? And boom, you're off to the races. Keep in mind the greatest peacemaker. Who is that? The Prince of Peace was very controversial, so much so that he ended up on a cross. I can agree with you that controversy, for the sake of controversy, is sin. But we all need to recognize that controversy, for the sake of truth, is a divine command, as the late Walter Martin, the original Bible answer man, used to say. I mean, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5 says, to tear down, demolish arguments and all the pretensions that set themselves above the knowledge of Christ. Jude 3 says, to put up a good fight for the faith, once for all delivered to the saints. Now, perhaps you just can't bring yourself to hold up a sign or do other such controversial things. That's fine, okay? Uh, look, we need your prayer. We need your support. We need to feel that you're behind us. Us conflict entrepreneurs, if you want to call us that. All right? In certain circumstances, of course. All right, let's look at the other one. We are commanded to correct in gentleness. The Bible is quite clear about this in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, 2 Timothy, 1 Peter 3, 15, the famous apologetics verse, in gentleness and respect. Okay, look, the New Testament term for gentleness is the term preotis. And it doesn't mean what our cultural conceptions these days mean by the term gentleness. It's govern by, number one, appropriateness to the situation that's called for. And number two, selflessness or humility. So get rid of those cultural assumptions of what gentleness is. It has nothing to do with fecklessness or weakness or not giving someone a sharp rebuke on occasion. The material content of Priotis is filled out by our Lord Jesus Christ, who not only corrected the woman caught in adultery, but also corrected the money changers at the temple. The situations were a little different there, and the responses were a little different there, if you recall. Okay. I, Look, one time I was driving with my then teen daughter, Maddie, and training her to drive. Okay? I'm in the passenger seat. And she's just slowly taking that left-hand turn when this traffic is coming pretty quickly. Now, do you think I was gentle with her in my response at that point? Well, no, if you mean our cultural assumptions. But yes, if you mean the New Testament term, Priotis. All right, let's go to some fun testimonies here. I want to read you some, particularly ones that were not mentioned in my chapter in sharing the good news with Mormons. In April 3rd, 2006, I get this. Hi, Rob. Enjoyed speaking to you a lot outside the LDS facility at Chestnut and Moreau in Carlsbad. Nice website. I would not have known about it without your sign. Thanks. 
May 2005. First off, I want to say I'm sorry. I don't know if it was you or someone else, but a few months ago, I had a very brief chat with someone carrying one of your signs. I asked if their name was Joseph, maybe just to get my attention. They said they were. <laughs> I told them I didn't want to read about their lies. Well, now I know you're right. Months ago, I started to look into church history, including your site, and found it very disturbing. I was in the bishopric up until then and was very stern and vocal about my beliefs, even to the point of brainwashing my little girl. Now I'm a recovering Mormon. I'm not as brave as you, so my wife doesn't yet know yet. Yet she does have some suspicion since I removed myself from the bishopric. It may take me a few years to tell anyone else you are the first. Your site is helping me to get through this time of life, and I feel so good about it. Next time I see someone with a sign about your website, I'll stick up for it. Now, one guy saw me out in front of Temple Square in Salt Lake City in May 2005 when Mike Norton was running josephlight.com. He was the originator of it. He contacted Mike, and they went back and forth. He wrote Mike this, well, you're right. Like you haven't heard that a good thousand times before. I just wanted to thank you for your sight. Listen to this, you guys. Even if it offended me before, it led me down a path I needed to take. October 2004, I get this. <laughs> Uh, this is from a guy named Kramer. He says, I've been living in L.A. listening to the Book of Mormon on CD during my commute. It took me months to finish. I was genuinely wanting to get that burning and bosom deal going on. Of course, it never happened. I bored myself to tears for an entire year in an L.A. commute. Shortly thereafter, I got transferred to Salt Lake City with work, and on my drive home one day, I saw this guy standing in front of the Alta Club holding a sign that simply read, josephlied.com. Curiosity got the best of me. I thought to myself, why does this guy feel it's so important to dedicate time and energy to produce a web page specifically dedicated to convincing people the church is false? Also, he seems like a normal dude out holding the sign, not one of those various Jesus freaks. Who, you see, wanting to have you accept Jesus, right? I read his webpage, all of it. I read Amazon.com book reviews on the Buy His Own Hand Upon Papyri by Chuck Larson, and then did the same on Todd Compton's In Sacred Loneliness. Holy beep! It hit me about 4 a.m. one morning on the internet reading book reviews. I eventually bought the books, but the genie was out of the bottle. I couldn't sleep for about four days. All the ramifications of what this meant. All those poor people that in the Will Martin Willie handcart companies that died for a bunch of beep. I wasted two years of my life on a mission in Guatemala for a crock of beep. Unbelievable. All the tithing money I paid. I'm raising my four kids in this insanity. Why didn't any of my five generations of ancestors figure this out? I'm so miffed, yet relieved at the same time. <laughs> On the other hand, I, as you can tell, I stuck in the myth word there. But, okay, on the other hand, I'm scared to death that I might ruin my marriage. Yet, I've been able to cut out all the beep busy work that creates, it creates, and, and of course, I've given myself a 10% raise. I'm completely changed my personal values. Time with my family is first. I now seek after goodness, truth, and beauty instead of simply following blindly with the bishop and elders quorum presidents say. I think my wife will come around. I'm actually a much better husband now than in days of yore. Time will tell. It's a long game, and I'm only in the first inning. Thanks to all of you and your posts, especially to that josephlied.com dude. <laughs> all right, now get this. Here's one I got from a gal named Christina in 
note the, note the date here, April 2013. I understand you're the guy behind josephlight.com. I saw a banner years ago at the Nauvoo Temple Open House or Orange County Temple. It was actually a Newport Beach Temple opening. Anyway, I looked at it, uh, looked it up at the time, put it on my shelf. Recently, my shelf finally came tumbling down. Thanks for planting the seeds of truth. Now get this, Newport Beach Temple opening was in 2005, November of 2005. That's eight years, you guys, before I got this email. Okay, let me skip that one. October 2004, this is one of my favorite testimonies. This is from a gal named Belinda, which is on my website, by the way. I saw you or a friend of yours recently near Temple Square with a sign that said josephlied.com. Kind of figured it was an anti-Mormon website, but I looked anyway, going against the counsel of the church, which encourages us not to read anything negative against the church. I now thank God that I ignored the counsel of the church. It was as if I were wearing blinders my entire life, and now I can see. I have spent the past week and a half reading everything I could get my hands on about the church. It's no wonder they don't want us to read that stuff. They just don't want us to discover the truth. I don't know if it was you, but I'm sure it was someone you know at the very least that was holding that sign. As I type this, I have tears streaming down my face, tears of joy for discovering the truth about Mormonism and now getting to really know my Savior, and tears of gratitude for your work and those like you that spread the truth. God bless you, sir, for all you do. You will never know how much you have blessed my life. I will now spend the rest of my life telling others still trapped in Mormonism about the truth and your sight. This brings up a very important point about blindness that I want you guys to keep in mind. Uh, it reminds me of Dave McCain, a friend of mine who went to go hear Walter Martin years ago, and he was LDS. He got up and asked the question of Martin. Martin answered that question. He walked away think Dave walked away thinking, this Martin's an idiot. That was such a stupid response. Well, a certain amount of time went by, and he ends up getting saved. And his brother or brother-in-law, whoever it was, that brought him to the event to hear Martin that night just happened to have old audio tape of that event and said, why don't you listen to it again and see what you think of yourself and the question you asked and Martin's re response. He listened to it, Dave did, and he goes, that was a perfectly good response that Walter Martin gave me. What was my problem? And then it clicked. There was a wall of blindness there that he just could not see out of. You need to keep that in mind because this ought to do two things. It ought to keep us from beating up on ourselves. Man, if I just would have framed the argument this way or if I just would have remembered that argument, then they would have fallen to their knees and said, what must I do to be saved, right? No, it, it doesn't work that way. Okay? You're in a very difficult mission field here. There's a lot of ground tilling that goes on. That, as Carl was talking about, takes years, right? And so we need to be patient and not beat up on ourselves. And secondly, we ought to be patient with unbelievers and not beat up on them because of their blindness. Let me read one last one to you. Hi, I recently left the LDS church. I was so unhappy and saw you walking around the Mesa, Arizona temple for the Easter pageant with your sign. After reading your website, you gave me the inspiration to finally leave, put all this behind me. Since then, Mormons have been coming to my door with cupcakes telling me that all other churches are established by Satan. I resigned my membership and got the letter in the mail stating so. I just wanted to say thank you. You gave me the final push to leave. All right, in conclusion, I have got some suggestions for you. I'm just going to run through these real quickly. Okay? You want to see results like I've been giving? Then uh, it's very simple. Two things. 
You need to cast your net widely and you need to be persistent. Now, the material content might take different forms. Right? Some of you may want to get a bumper sticker and put it on your car. Next, some of you might want to create a website or your own blog and start advertising that everywhere. Next, some of you, some of you can't see my shirt. Some of you might want to get a josephlight.com shirt or some other shirt that will be provocative and engender conversations. Next, some of you might just want to open up a can of street preaching sometime, somewhere, right? <laughs> Next, some of you might want to pass out tracks, books, DVDs, other material at other events. That was me back in 86 at some rodeo, I think in Vernal. Some of you might not be interested in any of this stuff, but you could put your money to it, right? You can, you can budget appropriately so others that feel called to be conflict entrepreneurs can get out there and do the stuff that they'd like to do. And we need your prayers too. The point is, start dreaming, church. And if you have started dreaming, well then dream bigger, Dare to be a little creative and ask yourselves how, and ask God what he would have you to do to get the good news out to more people. All right. In, let me just tell you, I have got a lot of good stuff. I, I'm selling our book, Sharing Good News with Mormons, Practical Strategies for Getting the Conversations, out right there at that book table there for 15 bucks. Okay? A lot of good approaches in there. Also, I've got a bunch of freebie stuff. I've got jwinfo.org bumper sticker for Jehovah Witnesses. I've got mormoninfo.org bumper stickers. I have got josephlide.com bumper stickers. I've got my business card. I've got all sorts of tracks, temple opening paper, temple square paper. Got all sorts of stuff back there. Take the stuff and get it out, okay? Thank you guys for listening, your attentiveness, and let's get out there and promote Christ.